Welcome to Prevention Is Now. I'm Deb Bonner, preventionist and community advocate for Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault. On August 14th of this year, Betsy DeVos's Title IX rule went into effect, severely reducing schools' obligations to prevent and respond to sexual harassment and assault. Some of these changes include narrowing what constitutes sexual harassment, narrowing the circumstances where a school is responsible for responding to a report, letting schools off the hook for most off-campus violence, and requires a live hearing, including cross-examination by parties' advisors. With the new administration taking office, it is likely some, if not all, the changes to Title IX will be reversed. The Biden administration has promised a quick end to Betsy DeVos's rule, but quick end is a relative term. DeVos enacted her changes to Title IX through a formal rulemaking process. This means barring congressional action, any overhaul to undo those changes will have to go through the same process, which can take as long as three years. Joining me today is Faith Ferber, a student engagement organizer with No Year 9. No Year 9 is a survivor and youth-led project of Advocates for Youth that aims to empower students to end sexual and dating violence in their schools. They accomplish this through educating college and high school students of their legal rights, training, organizing, and supporting student survivor activists in challenging their educational institutions to address violence and discrimination, and advocating for policy change at the campus, state, and federal levels. Faith herself is a graduate student at Rutgers University School of Social Work, where she specializes in violence against women and children. She also holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and women, gender, and sexuality studies from American University, where she also founded the Students Against Sexual Violence Club and created AU's Mandatory Sexual Assault Prevention Education Program. Faith, thank you for joining us. So let's start at the very beginning. What exactly is Title IX and who does it impact? Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited to be here. Um, Title IX is a federal civil rights law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in educational programs that receive federal funding. So while this doesn't cover all schools, it does cover the vast majority of schools in our country, and that's all the way from K-12 all the way through college or university. So if you're a student at a school that receives any kind of federal funding, And that could be schools that offer federal financial aid, schools that have received COVID relief funds, any kind of money from the federal government, then Title IX applies to you. And Title IX is really just one short sentence that's part of the larger education amendments of 1972. Some people might be more familiar with Title IX in the context of sports, but it was established through Alexander V. Yale in 1980 and other court cases since then that Title IX also applies to sexual harassment and sexual violence. And since 1987, the U.S. Department of Education has provided guidance clarifying what schools need to do to respond to students who report sexual harassment. And that's because the government recognized that experiencing sexual harassment or sexual violence can significantly impact someone's education, and therefore schools have the legal responsibility under Title IX to remedy the hostile environment that sexual harassment can cause. So that can look like investigating reports of harassment or providing resources or accommodations to ensure that students can stay in school after experiencing violence and disciplining perpetrators. And then if your school violates your Title IX rights, you can file a formal complaint with the Office of Civil Rights, which is part of the Department of Education. And they can investigate the complaint, enter into agreements with schools in order to get them into compliance with Title IX or they can issue fines or remove funding from schools who continuously violate Title IX. Now, I know there were a lot of changes that went into effect back in August. Can you go over some of those changes to Title IX and what impact those changes have had? Yeah, so under the Obama administration, and also thanks to really, really hard work from student organizers, uh, the Department of Education released guidances further specifying how schools needed to respond to reports of sexual violence. So then students like myself were able to see clearly laid out what Title IX required of our schools, and then we were able to use that information to hold our schools accountable or file Title IX complaints against them with the Office of Civil Rights. So the Department of Education under the Obama administration saw a huge influx in the number of reports being made and investigations into, into Title IX violations. But unfortunately, the Trump administration's response to this strain on the Office of Civil Rights was to significantly reduce schools' obligations to respond to violence in the first place, as opposed to increasing any resources so that they could better enforce Title IX. So as you mentioned, this started in 2017. 
Secretary of Education Becky DeVos rescinded all of the Obama era guidances and started the process of issuing new Title IX regulations. And it wasn't until this past May 2020 that the Department of Education released their new legally binding Title IX rule. And then, as you mentioned, schools had until August 14th to revise their Title IX policies to be in compliance with this giant 2033-page document. So the new rule is truly horrible in so many ways. Um, But the common theme throughout that you touched on is this massive rollback of civil rights that allows schools to systematically sweep sexual violence under the rug. So now under Title IX, schools are forced to dismiss any reports of sexual harassment that occur to students while not on school property or while studying abroad. They've also heightened the definition of sexual harassment so that survivors have to face escalating violence that severely impacts their education before their schools require to respond. They instituted policies that will discourage survivors from porting and push them out of the process, such as removing any time frame for how promptly Title IX reports must be investigated and requiring the survivor and perpetrator to be cross-examined by the representative of each party's choosing, meaning you could be questioned about your assault by your perpetrator's family member or fraternity brother or friend. And this new Title IX rule fails to mention any protections for queer and transgender students, leaving a really major gap where progress had previously been made in previous administrations. So this is very, very devastating stuff. And not only does it leave students without the critical protections that they need to stay in school after experiencing violence, but it also creates environments where sexual violence and rape culture can thrive because there's such a lack of enforcement. I know we mentioned that the Biden administration wants to pretty much throw out everything that these new rules did and put in place their their rules, but that could take up to three years to do. Why is it going to take so long to get these new rules in place? Yeah, so unfortunately, um, because this is guidance and regulations from the Department of Education, whoever's president at the time has a lot of control over how um, Title IX is enforced. And so we've seen, obviously, it took a very long time for the Trump administration to get this new rule in. And we're expecting the same thing to happen with Biden because, again, it will have to go through this same long notice and comment process where they'll release a proposed rule and the public will have the opportunity to comment on it. And then the department will have to review all of those comments and respond to them in the new Title IX rule. So that takes time. And then in addition to just that normal process, um, we've also seen that the Trump administration has really uh, stacked the courts with a lot of federal judges. Um, And so we are anticipating that there will also be lawsuits that are filed to try and prevent a new rule from going into place. And then once the new rule does go into into place, we also expect more lawsuits to try and stop it um, or strike it down. And so we're really expecting to see under the Obama administration or under the Biden administration, they're going to try and push through a rule that is fairly minimal Um, It's not going to be as thorough and as protective as maybe Obama era guidance was. And again, this is because we're expecting major legal battles with with Trump appointed judges. So we're seeing that there we're likely to have um, a pretty minimal rule come with the Biden administration. And again, we'll really, really need students um, who are willing to organize and make sure that their schools are doing more than the bare minimum and, and going further to protect survivors. Now, I know a lot of your work with Know Your Nine goes into supporting survivors of sexual violence, but you also do work in the area of prevention because that's that's really the best thing is to keep this sexual violence from happening in the first place. So with that in mind, the issue of consent remains a huge concern in the area of sexual violence prevention. And Know Your Nine is recommending schools adopt welcomeness as the standard in sexual misconduct policies over affirmative consent. What is the difference between the two and why is welcomeness a better option? Yeah, this is a great question. And the new rule doesn't define consent. So it really leaves it up to the schools or the states to decide. So affirmative consent or yes means yes policies define consent as clear, ongoing, enthusiastic agreements to whatever sexual act. And it specifically comes as a response to this idea of no means no. 
So affirmative consent improves upon no means no by focusing on the fact that the absence of a no does not equal consent. We know survivors can be forced or or coerced into consenting or can be too incapacitated to consent. Welcomeness builds off of this framework as well, but we believe it also does a better job of capturing situations where a survivor may provide affirmative consent, but in a situation of coercion or a power imbalance. So under a welcomeness framework of consent, sexual conduct is considered unwelcome if someone didn't request it or invite it, and the conduct is offensive or undesirable. The other great thing about welcomeness is that it applies to sexual harassment, such as unwanted sexual comments, just as much as it applies to sexual assault or rape. So it makes sense from a Title IX standpoint, which views sexual violence as a very serious form of sexual harassment. So even though not all unwelcome sexual behavior is considered sexual harassment under Title IX, we still recommend that students advocate for a welcomeness framework of consent. And also, this isn't a radical ask or anything like that, because the 2001 Department of Education actually released guidance directing schools to adopt a welcomeness standard in instances of sexual harassment. But a lot of schools just never change their policies. So again, this all points back to a need for the government to actually adequately enforce Title IX compliance. So now that we've determined uh, what a good standard of consent is, what else should be included in consent education programs? Well, first of all, and I'd say probably most importantly, consent education really needs to be ongoing. The research shows that it can't just be one online program or an hour-long session at your college orientation, that's not anywhere near as effective as having recurring and ongoing discussions about consent. Also thinking about the way rape culture has influenced people growing up, by the time we get to college, we have a lot of bad information about sex and consent that really has to be undone in these consent programs. And colleges and universities are legally required to provide prevention education for first-year students But schools can and should do much more than that. So at Know Your Nine, we recommend that consent education programs address common myths about what sexual violence looks like and who experiences it. Be specific in discussing your school's own policies and your school's specific resources. Providing actual skills that students can use and an opportunity to practice those skills, especially when it comes to communication. And ensuring that both the education itself and the facilitators are culturally competent. So in undergrad, I actually had the opportunity to help create the school's sexual violence prevention education program. And while the program was very successful successful overall, we really dropped the ball on cultural competency our pilot year. In trying to define and normalize healthy communication and consent, we heavily utilized two metaphors. And metaphors can be great, but one metaphor we used was about playing baseball, and the other was about ordering and eating pizza. So my school had a pretty large international student population, and we got feedback from a lot of them that our metaphors weren't helpful at all, and if anything, just made the topic of consent more confusing because they didn't know anything about baseball, they didn't regularly or if ever order and eat pizza. So we really have to go back to the drawing board and think about how to create a consent education program that made sense multiculturally. And I definitely learned that if you're not putting active consideration into accommodating the varying perspectives on sex and consent and relationships and communication that people are coming into the program with, you're not going to be as effective. We're talking with Faith Ferber, a student engagement organizer with Know Your Nine. Bystander intervention is one of the most commonly implemented forms of primary prevention. I mean, here at Picasa, we offer bringing in the bystander training for college campuses and coaching boys into men for male athletes in both high school and college levels. But there are a lot of options out there. What are some of the most important factors to consider when implementing a bystander intervention program? So a lot of the same elements that you'd consider for a consent education program, you're going to want in your bystander intervention program. So you want it to be ongoing, interactive, skills-based, culturally competent, trauma-informed, all that good stuff. And I think that bystander intervention programs are also a really great place to talk about and have students reflect upon their privilege. So for example, I'm a white small framed disabled person. I might not be able to physically intervene on a situation to the extent that a 6 to 200 pound football player could intervene. But it's also probably safer for me to intervene in situations than maybe a person of color should the police show up or something like that. So that's all really relevant and important to consider when you're thinking about bystander interventions. 
it's going to look different for everyone, which means we all have to take the time to think about what strategies will work best for us when the situation calls for it. So having this variety of skills that can be used is super critical. A bystander intervention program that considers the larger socio-political climate is also really important if you want the skills to be usable in real life. So in my dream world, bystander intervention programs would emphasize that while these trainings help stop violence on an interpersonal level, they don't substitute for the work that's needed to be done to stop violence on a systemic or institutional level as well. Creating protective environments is another powerful primary preventative measure. What are some of the ways Know Your Nine and its activists are trying to accomplish that? Absolutely. And, and you know, while Know Your Nine advocates for comprehensive consent education and bystander intervention training, we really see student organizing against sexual violence and for more protective environments as the key to creating massive change because it really shifts or at least challenges the social norms of what has previously been acceptable. Betsy DeVos with this new rule has really removed as many protective aspects of Title IX as possible. So our work has been really heavily focused on mitigating the harms of the rule by pushing schools to do more than the bare minimum when they're able to do so. Once the rule was released in May, we launched a nationwide petition campaign that students could circulate at their schools to push their administrators to implement more protective policies wherever possible. We had several demands. With COVID, for example, we were hearing that a lot of students, from a lot of students at their schools, just put their Title IX processes on pause because they weren't sure how to proceed completely remotely. Some people's conduct code specifically said these meetings have to happen in person. But clearly, survivors are still being impacted by violence during COVID. So one of our demands was that schools continue Title IX proceedings during COVID. And since then, the Department of Education has also come out and said, yes, you need to continue proceedings. We also wanted to address some of the major gaps in the new rule. So we included demands about creating a separate sexual misconduct policy to address violence that doesn't meet the new heightened standard under Title IX implementing a 60 to 90 day time frame for investigations, guaranteeing that survivors will have access to accommodations regardless of where or when the violence occurred, and following the rescinded 2016 guidance on protecting LGBTQ students. And we've seen a lot of schools commit to the policies we advocated for, so that has been very encouraging to see. Now, can you talk about some of the advocacy work Know Your Nine has been involved with, especially as it relates to uh, sexual violence prevention? Definitely. So a huge part of what our student engagement organizing team does is educate students to help them advocate for their rights. I really hate to say it, but it's extremely common that we see survivors who have been lied to by their schools because schools often bank on students not knowing their rights. So they'll tell survivors they can't investigate when they can or it's out of their jurisdiction when it's not. I heard from way too many students this summer that their school committed to ignoring the new Title IX rule and thus there was no need to organize. But that's a total lie. This rule is legally binding. Schools cannot ignore it. And oftentimes, student organizers can be successful in having their demands met just by proving that they're well-researched and understand what the school can and can't do. So this summer definitely showed me just how important it is that people are receiving regular education on their Title IX rights so that they can advocate for themselves and their communities. And I would also add that this year, we're putting a big focus on taking our advocacy to the state level. We just launched a state ambassador program with 39 students from 25 states in D.C. that I'm super excited about. They're going to be working to move state policies that mitigate the harms of the rule and do more to protect survivors. Again, this is what we see. This is what we're seeing with the incoming Biden administration. We can expect Title IX procedures to change once again, and this will take time. So focusing organizing efforts on the campus and state level is really critical at this current juncture. And I have encouraged our state ambassadors to dream big. We have a state policy playbook that outlines our policy recommendations from prevention to campus transparency to fair disciplinary procedures. So I would really, really love to see some more legislation reflecting best practices in the coming years. How can students get involved with Know Your Nine? You've got a lot going on out there. You're going to need a lot of help, I think. Absolutely. We really, really need students to get involved. As I said, we just started a new state ambassador program. So if there are any students that are interested in organizing around state policy in the new year, 
please feel free to reach out to us either on social media or over email at info at knowyour9.org. Um, we have three really awesome students representing Illinois. We'd love to connect you all with your state ambassadors. And additionally, we have a network for student activists by student activists. It's online. It's called the Know Your Nine Campus Action Network or Nine Can. It's an online space where students can collaborate with one another to support action, share resources, and build a more unified national movement to end sexual and domestic violence, both on campus and in the larger society. So if there are any students interested in connecting with other student activists or doing state policy work, we absolutely would love to help teach you all how to organize. Now, this would be for both high school and college students or just college? It can be middle school, elementary school, high school, college, grad school. It all applies. We Actually, our youngest state ambassador is an eighth grader from Kentucky, which is really exciting. All right. So where can people get more information? Uh, I know you gave your website again, but can you give us um, all your websites, your socials, all that fun stuff? Yep. Yeah, so our website is knowyour9.org, and it's knowyourix, like the Roman numeral nine. Our email is also info at knowyour9.org. I usually uh, man the info account, so if you send an email there, I will see it. Our Twitter is at knowyour9 with the Roman numeral nine, I-X, and our Instagram is at knowyour9 with the number nine. And we will put all of those links and everything in our show description, so they'll be there for everyone. Faith Ferber, a student engagement organizer with Know Your Nine, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. This has been Prevention Is Now. I'm Deb Bonner, preventionist community advocate for Perry Center Against Sexual Assault. If you would like more information on this program, you may call our offices at 217-744-2560 or send me an email requesting more information at dbonner at prairiecasa.org. I would also like to remind everyone that Prairie Center does offer bringing in the bystander training for colleges and universities in our service area. And if you are interested in more information on that program or how to bring other programs to your campus, please call our offices or email me. Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault supports children and adult survivors of sexual violence through counseling and legal and medical advocacy in 11 central Illinois counties. In addition to bringing in the bystander, Prairie Center also offers coaching boys into men for high school athletes as well as college athletes, and we offer sexual harassment prevention training for business and organizations in our area. Our main office is located in Springfield, Illinois, with satellite offices in Jacksonville and Taylorville, Illinois, and you can find out more about our services at our website at Prairie Casa. Org. This program is supported by a grant from the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Points of view or opinions contained in this program are those of Prairie Center Against Sexual Assault and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the official positions or policies of these grantors. Thank you for listening.